Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Luxembourg is one of Europe's smallest countries that used to build its economy around iron and steel. But don't let its size fool you. It is eyeing outer space to source minerals through asteroid mining. The first mission is expected within the next three years. Much of this effort is due to Etienne Schneider, then Luxembourg's deputy prime minister, who wants to turn the country into an outer space powerhouse. One of Europe's tiniest states now holds claim to being a giant in the space industry. Luxembourg, known as the leading private banking center in the Eurozone, now generates nearly 2% of its annual GDP from the space industry, the highest of any country. Luxembourg's Space Resources Initiative is its plan to position the country as the European heart of exploration and use of space resources. Space mining is Luxembourg's present focus. From around 30 companies in Luxembourg's space sector, there is a vast pool of talent and expertise in satellite telecommunications. They draw on the pool for the development of extracting resources from the moon or from thousands of asteroids. The first asteroid prospecting missions are expected within the next three years. Eventually, Celestial mining firms hope to harvest materials that can be processed in space and then used for on-site construction to sustain human life in space or, in the very long term, shipped back and sold on Earth. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, welcome to CGTN. Thank you. You have been nicknamed by some as the space miner in your country. How did that name come from? Well, I guess it, uh, it comes from my uh, spaceresource.lu initiative, which I launched uh, some two years ago, where we really want to bring our country into space, meaning that uh, we want to develop uh, commercial activities in space. And uh, that's an initiative uh, we took uh, two years ago, as I said, and which has a tremendous success. But people would say that's quite ambitious for a country like Luxembourg and uh, having an outer space plan. 35 years ago, we launched uh, as a government together with private investors the satellite company SES, which is now uh, one of the biggest uh, commercial satellite operators uh, in the world. And, uh, and uh, that was uh, at that time a very uh, ambitious idea. And uh, many people didn't believe in Luxembourg uh, being able to develop uh, this kind of space activities, but uh, now we are one of the leaders. There are several things that need to, you need to handle, I guess, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. One is the international legislation, whether we have some agreements about that. Secondly, of course, technological. And thirdly, what about uh, the international cooperation in terms of developing it? Because Luxembourg would not be able to do it alone. Mm -hmm. So all of these, how could it happen? When I was uh, discussing with um, many different startups in this kind of business, they were telling me that uh, they've got some problems to find investors because the, uh, the um, uh, property uh, uh, question is not solved by the United uh, Nations right. uh, Space Treaty, which dates back to 1967. And at that time, uh, um, doing business in space or doing space mining was just uh, science fiction. So nobody was addressing uh, this question. So what we did was in analysis of the international uh, legal framework and then we decided to get a proper f uh, framework, legal framework in Luxembourg which allows companies to harvest uh, minerals for instance in space and to, to own them, to possess them and to commercialize them. Mm. And that's uh, a very, very important step in order to allow these companies to develop themselves, in order to uh, uh, make their lives easier uh, uh, because they need to find investors. Mm. What we are working on right now is to uh, put in place a, um, a fund, an investment fund in order to invest into these uh, startups and uh, that's what we are discussing right now with different investors and uh, I guess we will uh, have this fund in a few months time. What kind of scale are you looking at in the very near future? We want to be um, let's say the host nation 
of all these uh, of all these companies which want to develop uh, space business in space. You know, there's there's quite a lot of uh, of uh, different areas where we want to cooperate. For instance, exchange of uh, information, then uh, um, working together on research and uh, development activities, uh, putting our forces together. Uh, my aim is to bring all the like-minded countries uh, around the table and to di discuss together with them what are our aims, what, wh where do we want to get, mm. and how can we do so as soon as possible and as cheap as possible. Now you see a lot of debate in Europe when it comes to immigrants when it comes to how to solicit the best talents from around the world. How do you as the Deputy Prime Minister of your country see that issue? We have always had a completely open economy. We have always been completely open to all kinds of investors and all, also to all kinds of people who wanted to work in, in Luxembourg. But now people say the trend is different. The wind is blowing the other way around. People want to say, my country first. Uh, Luxembourg counts now 47% of foreigners living in the country and we don't even have a right-wing party which is fighting against these foreigners. <laughs> so, you know, everybody in Luxembourg knows that we need this foreign workforce, we need this immigration and we need foreign capital to be invested. What about outside your country? You're part of the EU. I mean, you cannot draw on your own policy just like that. You have to negotiate with the rest of the EU countries. Yeah. What about that part? I must tell you that it's something uh, which makes me a little bit sad if I'm seeing this more nationalistic debates getting back into the European Union, in some of the European Union uh, countries. I, I, can, I can just uh, tell them that it's not the right way to go and it has never been a solution to anything. To but the question EU. is, is your voice big enough, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, uh -huh. inside the EU? Yeah, apparently not, apparently not, because otherwise uh, some countries would not uh, close their doors as they're doing or trying to do uh, right now. So but what can we you are do? fighting for it. We are fighting for it on the European Union level. But as you said, we are a small country with small voting rights. But on the other hand, we are trying to convince other countries to stay open and to not abolish uh, uh, immigration because you know Europe is quite an old continent mm. and people are getting quite old or are quite old uh, in aging Europe. population it, it, exactly aging of the population it will be a big issue in the in the years to come so we should be a little bit wiser and a little bit uh, uh, more forward-looking okay the scenario is people will listen to you or they see their own interest in listening to ideas like what you have just said mm -hmm. the other scenario is they wouldn't mm -hmm. there are only two options and therefore, how would Luxembourg be able to function if the option is not the best one that you would prefer? Nobody can forbid Luxembourg to be an open, open country and to accept uh, uh, immigration into our country. So, you know, if the other countries will not, don't want to understand how important immigration is, not only for the economy, but also for the, uh, for the survival of their countries in the long term, we understand it and we will continue having uh, immigration uh, in Luxembourg. And therefore, there are very confusing political landscape in the EU as to who will be the leadership, who has the quality of the being the leadership, uh, which direction will the leadership lead the rest of the EU to go, even though it is a very equal uh, membership uh, you know, uh, entity. So, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, what do you make of this apparent chaotic situation? What is the logic that Luxembourg is keen on among all these mixed up pictures? The years after 2008 have been very uh, difficult for many of the European Union countries. And so, the country is more and more divided on different important um, important European topics right. and we are quite happy to see that finally France and Germany seem to go into the same direction meaning that Europe must get become stronger again but still you're right there are some countries which are going into uh, into the other direction mm. and uh, and that's a problem we will have to tackle mm. but the good thing is you know governments come and they go again so the policy is changing also every four to five years so if you have countries with which are uh, let's say more euro skeptic 
uh, you have the chance that maybe a few years later there will be another government which will be more favorable. Luxembourg, of course, is very keen on designing its own blueprint about its own future. In this big picture, where does the relationship between Luxembourg and China fall? China was always a very good partner. And uh, there was a big difference, I guess, between Luxembourg and many other, or let's say at least many big European countries towards China. Because many of them want to protect their economies uh, against Chinese investors because they want to protect their national champions. We never had national champions in that way, apart from the steel industry. Right. But, you know, we never closed our doors and we never tried to avoid Chinese investments mm. in Luxembourg. The opposite is the case. We are coming to China in order to find investors which might use Luxembourg as their European hub, as their gateway uh, to Europe. And we really helped them to develop their activities. Right. And, and I think that's a big difference between many other countries we never had any single problem with one of our Chinese investors uh, in Luxembourg. And you know that the uh, Bank of China is the first Chinese bank outside of China. And it was, uh, uh, they came to Luxembourg. And uh, uh, Madame Zhou Li Hong, who is the CEO of the, of the bank, she's a good friend of mine because due to uh, all our collaboration, due to the fact that uh, we really have very tight links mm. to our Chinese community uh, in Luxembourg, there's mutual uh, trust and understanding. Right. And but what about the Belt and Road Initiative? Um, there are different views about that. Uh, some of those from Europe might be skeptical about it. Uh, what is your view, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister? What does China want to do, do you think, with this? You know, first of all, we uh, fully support this initiative because we think it's the right way to do. Mm. Second, and here again, Luxembourg was the first non-Asian country to, uh, to um, uh, become a member of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Mm. So there again, and I can tell you that there was some pressure from some other countries. What kind of pressure? Pressure not to become a member of this. Uh, a Remember at the time bank. when you were making this decision, what was the pressure that you were facing at the time? You know, I would would you like to describe in words to I me? I will not tell you which country, <laughs> but it was a very big country, which uh, didn't really want us to, uh, to become a, uh, a part of this initiative. But, you know, we didn't care about that because, as I told you before, we have a really good experience with our Chinese partners and that's why we wanted to, mm. to show that we will continue supporting China in developing their activities and uh, the Run uh, Belt Run Road initiative is really something which we think will be in the interest not only of China but of all other countries mm. which, can which participate at it. Which stage do you think that has already been developing to? Well, that's a good question. Mm. That's a good question which I will not be able to answer to you right now because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have the, 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 the insight into all of these activities. There are some issues, as you said, sir, you are very keen on, and yet maybe different compared to some of the other countries. One of those is about what to do with tech companies internationally. Mm -hmm people see these companies are becoming sometimes even bigger than middle-sized countries and data providing a lot of power but at the same time they also provide a lot of convenience to people that are using these services how do you see as a national leader the growth of these kind of companies and the relationship between countries I mean governments and these businesses you know, I don't really see a, 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 a big problem having these big uh, companies. Mm. I see more problem um, uh, uh, in cybersecurity, yes. protection of information, uh, of, of data. All this will be or is already a tremendous challenge for for the countries in order to regulate all this, mm. I mean, you know, in order to make sure that your data is not used when you don't want it to be used by others. Mm. So. I see the problem more in that perspective, and then maybe on the uh, maybe there's another problem. We have to make sure that these companies also pay taxes somewhere. Mm -hmm. because, uh, and that could be an issue. That For example, your country is related is to right now. Absolutely, that is an issue, and it is an important issue. And we have to make sure that <coughs> these companies have to pay their fair share somewhere. 
But nowadays, with all, the, with all the possibilities they have, and due to the huge impact they, mm. they can have on nation states, uh, they are quite, quite successful in avoiding uh, uh, taxes. And, and I think we should find a way to make them pay their fair share uh, wherever they are active not in, 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 in one single country, but wherever they are active. So thank you so much, Mr. Deputy Prime thank Minister, you. for being with us.